A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery and sometimes the misery of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Hello, my friends. Today, my guest is Donald Robertson. Donald was born in Irvine, Scotland, and he became a specialist in teaching evidence-based psychological skills, known as an expert on the relationship between modern cognitive behavioral therapy and classical Greek and Roman philosophy. Oh, my goodness. Who merges those two things? And if that wasn't enough, he was also interested in Eastern studies and found a common thread, perhaps, to all of those, a common root in Stoicism. His most recent book is called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, published this year in 2019. I really enjoyed it, and you'll hear this in the interview, but part of what I love so much is that he brings to life these figures from antiquity, from ancient history, and helps us understand who they were, how they lived, what lessons they have for us that are still relevant. In fact, maybe more timely than ever. I hope that you enjoy this storytelling, this learning, this biography of sorts. And by the way, when we get to the end of this interview and I ask him for his insights and experience about the creative process and writing, I love what he shares. He talked about preparing some food in advance for himself and during writing stretches of days at a time eating nothing but boiled eggs, apples, and coffee. It's like, Oh, man, I'd be motivated to get my writing done, too, if that was all I had to eat. (laughs) So anyway, I hope you enjoy this. I hope you learn something and I hope you become a better person because of it and then use that better self you've become in service to others. Donald, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really grateful you would join me for this conversation. And I want to start with the question I ask all my guests to lead off. What's life about? What's life about? Well, for me, you know, I think creativity is an important part of it, right? Like it's one of the main things that I find in practice that, that gives life meaning. And also, you know, uh, just to borrow a famous quote from one of my favorite philosophers, Socrates, Socrates in Plato's Apology famously says, the unexamined life is not worth living. So I think life is about understanding life reflecting on it like and trying to kind of gain more wisdom and more knowledge about why we're here and what we're doing the process of learning the process of understanding is part of the goal of life itself i think that resonates with me for sure and i suspect with many people listening to this when people ask who you are and what you do how do you like to answer that question or how do you typically answer it well, that's another good question as well, because I guess it's changed quite a bit for me over the years. My background uh, originally was I studied philosophy at university, and then I got into practicing as a, a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist. And so that profession is something that I very much still identify with, although I don't do as much clinical practice anymore. I tend to do a bit more coaching and stuff. But increasingly, I spend most of my time writing and teaching now about philosophy and psychotherapy. So I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist who integrates what he does with classical philosophy. I guess that's how I'd sum up who I am and what I do. Now, I haven't studied this exhaustively, but I think there's probably not a lot of you out there. Like this is a pretty, this is, you know, they say get rich in your niche. Yeah. Have you found your niche? I think, very. you know, I, the, the thing is I was lucky enough to find it quite early on, right? Quite a long time ago. Um, I feel blessed for that you know i mean people spend their whole lives trying to find uh, a way of bringing their interests together and i found a way of bringing together several things that i was interested in so they clicked neatly together and i was able to make a a career a living out of what i did i turned my hobby into my vocation my career 
And uh, yeah, like uh, it's I combined several subjects, so there's not really that many other people doing it. And when I started off doing it, there wasn't as much interest in it. And then luckily for me, it kind of becoming increasingly popular. So, you know, I feel like we're kind of on a roll now with uh, stoicism as a form of self-help. It's become a, a fairly popular subject. That's my experience just poking around online and reading some of the conversations of where personal growth and development and leadership are, where that conversation is uh, today. And by the way, I just I just want to share this because this is very rare for me. Um, your book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. What's rare for me is that I actually bought a physical copy at a, at an actual bookstore, <laughs> which I'm just going to acknowledge myself for that right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I think most of the copies that have been sold seem to me to be the audiobook at the moment. You know, there's the ebooks become popular, but a, a lot of people increasingly seem to be listening to the audiobook. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of pleased to see when people go into actual bookshops and support them so that they don't all disappear from the world. And I'm pleased when I yeah. go in a bookshop and I see one on the shelf there. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. With the audiobook, and I feel like I might be teasing the listener because I haven't said much about the book yet, and I will in a moment. Did you read the audio for the audiobook? Yeah. How was your experience with that? I haven't asked a, a guest about this yet. Yeah, cool. Well, in terms of, you know, the, sort of the whole process and stuff. Well, I mean, I can tell you a little story about it. You know, like it, originally my publisher really wanted a, a, a voice actor, a professional voice actor to do it. So we had to kind of uh, debate that a little bit and put the case forward for me recording it in Toronto. And it was kind of short notice because I was due to travel to Austria to do some research for my next book, actually. And so we were cutting out a bit fine. I had to go into the studio here and it was long sessions. Um, you know, they told me normally they'd maybe do a few hours, but I was doing maybe eight or nine hours just at the microphone reading the book. That was like an Iron Man. Yeah, tiring. Yeah, like even just sitting in a stool for that amount of time, you know, I was doing my back in and stuff. But like uh, we did it and I'm, I'm really glad that we did it um, because I kind of wanted to to put something into the, the audio book. It, it meant a lot to me, you know. And actually, when I was writing the book, I guess maybe this jumps ahead a little bit, but for me, I guess what I'll say just now is that the creative process itself involves reading the book aloud, like from the, the manuscript. Um, so, I, you know, I think, I guess I approached it right from the outset as if it were an audio book and something to be read aloud and listened to. Yeah. So... Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about your experience with it, and and now I'm thinking maybe I ought to get myself that audiobook as well to go along with with my hard copy here. Who did you write this book for? Like, why did you write it? Who did you write it for, and what did you want it to do for them? Well, I wrote it. I mean, whenever I write stuff now, it's insofar as possible, I try and do it with my little girl in mind. You know, I just find that helps me a lot. Uh, it makes things a little bit more real so I imagine she's a bit young for this book now but I imagine maybe when she's grown up like one day she might like potentially read it so I try and have that as a kind of reference point what would I want my own child to read you know like uh, you know and, and thinking of it so you know what sort of advice would other people want to pass down to their children I think is kind of a useful perspective to adopt when we're looking at this kind of self-help philosophy stuff and, you know, I, I, I've worked in this area for a long time and I'm lucky enough to have a lot of contact with my audience through the various things that I do, speaking at conferences and running online forums and running online courses and all this kind of stuff. So I get a lot of feedback, I have a lot of conversations. So I'm lucky enough to have quite a, a good sense of who the readers are and the sort of questions that they typically ask and so i i have all that stuff in mind like from years and years of chatting to people um and thinking what sort of problems do people run into when they're reading about this philosophy what sort of questions do they typically have and so that all those kind of experiences over the last 20 years or so kind of meshed into one gave me some reference point when i was writing the book you know what what questions are people likely to ask i try to preempt those I think you've done a masterful job at that because you've blended a very, uh, first of all, you've created a very readable book. You know, I love this story where, you know, some of these were names I'd heard before, but didn't know much about, to be honest. And you really brought them to life. In fact, I want to ask you if you'd be willing to share a bit of some of these stories that I want to bring up, as well as this, you know, these concepts of, I, I suppose they are cognitive behavioral therapy concepts, many of them. 
and then going back to the original philosophy and showing how they're maybe not so different mm -hmm. and then making it practical where we can apply it. And I, I just, I think it's really well done. Oh, thanks very much for saying that. I mean, that was my goal. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a story, actually, that maybe helps put it in context. You know, I was asked to write another book that's kind of an introduction to Stoic philosophy. And this is my sixth book. Um, on philosophy and psychotherapy. And I'd already written a kind of self-help introduction to, to Stoicism. It's called Teach Yourself Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. I wrote it back in 2013, I think it was. So I thought, look, I've done that already. And there are loads of other books coming out now. You know, some are written by my friends, Massimo Pellucci, Chuck Chakrapani, a bunch of people have got books out about Stoicism and how to apply self-help. So I thought, this has kind of been done. Like, but how can I write a book like this, but do it from a, a different perspective. And one of the things that came to mind was, well, you know, like we were, I was saying a moment ago, telling my little girl um, stories and, and, you know, and te teaching people through stories is important to me. So um, I wanted to try and write an introduction to Stoicism that weaved it in with these historical biographical stories about Marcus Aurelius and Socrates and so on, because I thought it made it more engaging I and mean, it helps present Stoicism also in a more realistic and, and rounded way. I think you've done that in, in, on a selfish note, you know, or self-interested note. One of the things I love that I didn't, I didn't expect, I didn't know this about Marcus Aurelius, is that he was privileged to be very wealthy. You know, it's part of the, his family have a lot of, you know, a lot of opportunities and things like this, but he never let that unduly influence him. In fact, in some ways, he kind of renounced it. Yeah. Which I thought was a kind of a parallel, even with the Buddha, of how, you know, here's this prince that, you know, goes out into the world and meets with real issues and doesn't just indulge himself in the comforts and luxuries that he easily could have. And in so doing, not only, I think, lived a, an exemplary life, but also provides a model mm -hmm. for others that last through generations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, there are little traces of that in the histories, actually. I think, if I remember rightly, there's one little anecdote about how um, the question of his wealth came up. And he said, look, by being acclaimed emperor, I no longer have any wealth because it's now all at the disposal of the state. So his personal wealth now, you know, he, at least in his eyes, became, you know, uh, at the disposal of the, of the Roman state. And so he wasn't, in a sense, wealthy any, any, anymore as, as he would have been as a, a private citizen. And he also uh, gave away a lot of his inheritance to his sister, um, and he refused a, a, a lot of bequests and so on. Um, during the, the, he had to face two major wars during his reign, and and the the treasury was exhausted at the beginning of one of them. And we are told that he had an auction and sold off many of his personal possessions and many treasures uh, from the imperial palace gems and clothing and so on in order to raise funds for the, the war effort. So his lack of attachment to wealth may even have benefited him in a, a practical way in terms of supporting the war effort. When, and that was one thing that I just found myself, the deeper I got into the book, the more I really loved and admired Marcus and that thing about giving the inheritance to his sister, but also later when I don't know why or how this came about, but he had the opportunity to receive other inheritances and he would pass them to the next of kin. I was like, no, I'm good. We'll give it to somebody else who can use it more. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and he, like other um, other Roman emperors or Roman noblemen in general would live very extravagant lives. And, you know, Marcus, like his adoptive father, Antoninus Pius, was known for um, simplicity, like he wasn't pretentious, like he, you know, he liked simple clothing, simple food, you know, had very basic needs, you know, it, like there are two types of, you know, some people, the more money they have, the more they find themselves spending. Yeah. And there's other people that, you know, even if they are lots of money, they don't they, I increase their expenditure that much. They're happy with the, the basics in life. And he was like that. He was happy with simple things. Yeah. I, I really admire that. And by contrast, you know, with his um, brother or half brother, yeah. Lucius, his adoptive um, brother, yeah, his adoptive brother, yeah. This this story that you told about the parties, like the part, like at least one party that Lucius threw, where they gave the, you know, when they served every course of, and the meat would come to the table, that he would gift that animal to yeah. every guest, yeah. and then the fixtures or whatever, the golden, you know, candle candelabras or whatever. Will you talk a little bit about? 
Lucius and about the kind of – and as a contrast to how Marcus was, how was he? And, and just like bring him to life for us a little, if you will. Certainly, the way he's presented in the histories is a really contrasting character. And I should say also, he's kind of like Roman families were complex. Roman noble families were kind of a little bit complicated. And so Lucius and uh, Marcus Aurelius were both adopted by the emperor Antoninus Pius. Um, and Lucius Verus, Marcus's adoptive brother, was about nine years younger than him. So we're also told that Marcus kind of viewed him as a son. And he actually married Marcus's daughter. So he was his brother and his son-in-law. This is sounding a little bit like Game of Thrones right now. Like, <laughs> I need a chart for this. <laughs> yeah. It's like you need a diagram for it or something. But we're kind of told, although he's technically, like, legally, he was referred to as his brother, he treated him more like a son. And actually, he would have been in line, in a sense, to succeed Marcus. He was co-emperor. So for the first time, actually, in the Roman in Roman history, there were two emperors reigning at the same time, although Marcus was kind of the senior, and we're told Lucius Verus was like his subordinate or lieutenant. But also, that would mean that if Marcus had died, Lucius Verus would have succeeded him, him as emperor. But he died relatively young, possibly from the plague. And uh, he was the opposite of Marcus in terms of his character. He was very extravagant. He was kind of like a playboy character. He threw these huge parties. He had many lovers. He, he was generally portrayed as being kind of negligent in terms of, of his role. He was sent to the East to oversee the Parthian War, and he really just delegated it to his generals and went off partying instead. Um, whereas Marcus was like a workaholic and incredibly conscientious about everything he did. Lucius Verus seems to not really have stepped up to the responsibilities of his role and really just used his power and wealth as an excuse to have fun and go around partying and stuff like that. Um, but they both studied Stoic philosophy in their youth and, and Marcus embraced it. And Lucius seems to have kind of went to the, the lessons and studied under the philosophers, but then just kind of abandoned it. You know, so you know, even though they both had a similar education, it took root in one of those you know, like, uh, youths, and then the other one, it didn't really. He just ignored it. I'm trying to do the thing where I'm anticipating what is my listener experiencing right now. What are they taking away? What's the value in this for them? And I'm not sure what you see, but what I saw when I read this was where where these can just be names from antiquity. It's yeah. like, what do they have to do with me? Why should I care? But what I saw was first of all that I think Marcus was. It seems to me he truly was motivated by a desire to serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his workaholism wasn't just his way of it wasn't his unhealthy way unhealthy way of coping with stress or whatever as I think many of us do. But in fact it was this this willingness to really engage in an effort, even if it was difficult, or maybe especially when it was difficult, that is part of at least what led to him dying at what, fifty eight years old? Yeah. So so he lived a somewhat long life where here's his brother by contrast, who in some ways has you know, he's younger, but he's in the same privileged position. And he chooses to use his resources in a very different way, a very consumptive, conspicuous, ostentatious mm -hmm. kind of way, indulging in luxury that by contrast, he actually dies maybe 20 years in age earlier than Marcus. Yeah, I read about that, yeah. And it's like, I just, so I'm struck by this idea that even though life in our modern age is more comfortable, in some ways it's easier than ever before, that that ease doesn't mean it's any better. And how can we follow Marcus's example of really giving ourselves completely to something and having to make a difference, having perhaps it leading to a longer life even? I mean, what, what do you take away from these two as kind of contrasting figures? Well, I suppose there's a couple of things that, that you know, that sparks. I mean, one is just the observation. Marcus was also renowned for being quite physically frail and unhealthy for whatever reason. He was quite active as a youth. And then, but then in, in sort of early adulthood, he, he seems to have developed various health conditions that plagued him throughout the rest of his life. We don't know exactly what they were. Some people believe he had severe stomach ulcers, for example, had problems with his appetite and so on. So people thought he was going to die at any moment. Like throughout his reign, they thought, you know, like the, the empire is resting on the shoulders of this guy that looks like he could kill over and die at any moment. Um, and they, they saw Lucius Verus as, as being a much hardier, tougher, healthier character. But ironically, he didn't last as long, you know. So don't judge book by its cover kind of thing. And, and by the way, the detail you included about Lucius being fairly handsome, yeah. having blonde hair, even sprinkling gold dust <laughs> right. in yeah, his hair totally. to accentuate. Like 
man, this guy must have been a real character. Oh, yeah, yeah. He seems to have been quite charismatic in some ways. And they, they seem to have been kind of grooming him to be um, the head of the military, basically, right from the outset. I think Marcus wasn't as interested in that side of things, and he thought Lucius would, would be able to take over that side for him, but he didn't actually do a very good job of it. So Marcus had to kind of step in and take command of the military as well. But the, the other way you can look at it, I suppose, very simply, is Lucius had embraced quite a kind of hedonistic lifestyle. But, I mean, I think we can stick our, stick our neck out and say, you know, it looks like it wasn't really making him happy, right? Yeah. So he was partying and stuff. I, I think it's, I'd hesitate to say this, but I think it's, because we're not told it explicitly, but it's very strongly implied in the histories that he was part, well, perhaps an alcoholic. Um, like, he really indulged in binge drinking and got into bar brawls and all sorts of problems. Um, so it looks like he, by modern standards, he might be considered an alcoholic. And he, he was kind of racked with anxiety about his role as the co-emperor and so on. Whereas Marcus, although he kind of took more respons- far more responsibility on his shoulders, um, I think he might say that he ultimately lived a more satisfying and fulfilling life because he felt that he was actually achieving something. As he felt he didn't have much choice. You know, the future of European civilization was kind of literally resting on his shoulders, the, the fate of uh, the Roman Empire. But he rose to the challenge. And although he had to put up with terrible adversity in his life, you know, the, the plague for a start and, and great personal loss, um, I think he had a sense that he was living a fulfilling and important life and doing something that was valuable. Whereas I think Lucius Verus probably felt kind of guilty about the fact that he was frittering his opportunity away and that alcohol and partying was a form of distraction, if you like, a, a kind of band-aid yeah. to cover up the emptiness that was inside him. That was the sense I got, you know, reading reading it for sure. One thing I love about the way that you characterize these ancient philosophers is I love this description that they were warriors of the mind. Whereas today, by contrast, it could, you could be, you know, forgiven for thinking that philosophers are today. Philosophers are merely librarians of the mind. (laughs) Yeah. But this idea that people were really engaged in these questions and these practices as a way of living a life of virtue, a a good life, a meaningful life. I read, um, I think it's Dan Gilbert's book. Uh, I might be getting his name wrong, but, uh, 10% Ten percent happier. Uh, do you know this book about meditation? No, I haven't read that one actually. So he talks about. I'm, I'm sorry. I think it's Dan Harris. Dan Harris is ten percent happier. But in the book, one of the things he said, and you know maybe he's wrong, but maybe he's right about a Buddhism was not considered a religion until maybe two hundred years ago when yeah. scholars started collecting you know these precepts and principles and put them together. As I read your, as I read your book, and I haven't read a lot about Stoicism or Greek philosophy or Roman philosophy or anything like that, but I found myself going, "How did Buddhism take this path where it has become a world religion?" And Stoicism seems like it easily could have, but never quite did. What's your view on why this collection of principles that can help us truly live a meaningful life never quite took shape like like Buddhism did? Well, that, that is a big question, and actually I feel that the scholars don't really have a definitive answer to that, but there's a couple of observations that we can make. Um, I mean, still, first of all, Stoicism was around for a long time. So from the time it was founded by Zeno of Citium in Athens, 301 BC, to the last and mo- last famous Stoic of the ancient world, Marcus Aurelius, who happens to be, from our perspective anyway, the most famous Stoic, that is nearly 500 years, nearly 500 centuries, nearly five centuries, during which Stoicism is kind of thriving as a philosophy of life in Greece and Rome and then throughout the Roman Empire in general. And Well, and, and by the way, Donald, sorry to, to, to jump in here, but, but to distinguish in, for our listeners that what we're talking about here is Stoicism with a capital S. Yeah, yeah. As, as opposed to Stoic, Stoicism or Stoic with a lowercase s, as many people know the word today. Yeah, this is right? an oddity of our language. Like we use... Uh, names that occur in Greek philosophy with a, a lowercase uh, letter to, to mean something. It's almost like a caricature. So Epicurean today just means someone that enjoys their food or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas in the ancient world, it was a, a whole philosophy of life. 
uh, embrace simplicity and uh, uh, peace of mind is the goal. And cynicism today means kind of being negative about things and pessimistic, whereas in the ancient world it was again a philosophy of life, a kind of precursor of, of stoicism. So that this is true of many terms that we find in Greek philosophy, and stoicism again has gone through this kind of degradation of meaning. So that it just means being unemotional as a coping style, whereas actually it came from originally this whole massive uh, philosophical system that endured for for five centuries in the ancient world. Um, something far more complex uh, than what the word implies today, basically. So. Um, yeah, like uh, the the meaning has changed over over time considerably. So where were, what were we saying? I've lost the thread. About so we were talking about why this didn't persist. Oh, why it didn't persist? Okay, yeah. So first of all, it was around for a while. I right? know. Again, another comparison. So Marxism, psychoanalysis. You know, in modern terms, maybe you know survived as philosophies or uh, systems of thought for a hundred years or so. You know, that's a drop in the ocean compared to how long Stoicism was a thriving philosophy in the ancient world. But it was kind of superseded. It, it, it seems to have been assimilated into other philosophical systems, into Neoplatonism, the philosophy that followed uh, Platonism and what's called the academic school. And then not long after that, Christianity became the, the, the dominant religion in the Roman Empire and Christianity seems to have kind of superseded Stoicism it assimilated some parts of Stoicism into it, it appealed mo much more widely than Stoicism so one of the things that people sometimes say is that Greek philosophy wasn't really embraced as much by women or by slaves but mainly by you know, educated males in the ancient world um, whereas when Christianity came along, it, pervased, it was much more pervasive in society. Like women engaged with it, slaves engaged with it, people all strata of society. Um, and so it became a much bigger cultural force. And so you could say Stoicism got assimilated into other philosophies, and then it was kind of superseded by Christianity. And the other thing that people sometimes say is that maybe during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, perhaps because of the plague and other catastrophes, it looks like it, it, the, the, the population became kind of more superstitious um, and desperate in some ways. They were surviving this plague that killed five million people throughout the empire, and they turned to magic spells and amulets and you know, so on as a, a way of coping with a world that just seemed horrific and out of, the, out of their control. And so rational philosophies like Stoicism struggled to compete with the quick fix kind of a, a appeal of sorcery and, and religion and magical thinking and so on. When you say that some parts of Stoicism kind of got absorbed by or appropriated or whatever by Christianity, what do you point to? Well, by the way, a, a quick aside, the, the Stoics are actually in the Bible. Um, in the New Testament, in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul goes to Athens and we're told that he speaks to a bunch of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers at the Areopagus, at the, the foot of the Acropolis. I would say, um, I mean, there are really a bunch of things from Stoicism that look like they may have influenced Christianity. Um, but generally, funnily enough, the, the Stoic ethics... The idea of the brotherhood of man is there in Stoicism and treating other people as our, our equals and caring about humanity in general it is was a kind of radical idea in Greek philosophy and it's very much associated with Stoicism. And then we see that kind of laying the foundation for Christian ethics, I think. Mm, yeah, I can, I can see that. You know, someone whose name you mentioned just a few minutes ago, Azino, I want to ask you about him. Mm -hmm. um, his saying about in the, the as a merchant right who was shipwrecked and he later told this story after being shipwrecked that his most profitable moment began yeah. at that time will you will you share a little bit about who he was and what that what that story was why is why is he an important figure well i guess in a way you have to kind of know, mention a little bit about phoenician culture in general so the phoenicians became particularly associated with the trade in uh royal or imperial purple so this precious so in the ancient world dyes if certain colors were sometimes difficult to obtain not not like today um and this very rich purple dye that was used to to dye the, the clothes of kings and emperors was incredibly expensive and highly sought after it was notoriously one of the worst jobs in the ancient world to create this stuff because you had to harvest hundreds of thousands of these sea snails 
and then they were fermented and by hand you had to pick out their innards and this kind of tedious like it probably stank to high heaven so one of the grossest most you know unpleasant jobs in the world was used to make one of the most precious commodities that was uh, you know, associated with the, the most powerful people in the world that that still sounds a bit there's a little bit of capitalism in there. I yeah. think this is alive and well today in some form, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does remind me of certain things in modern society. <laughs> so Zeno was probably reasonably wealthy, and he was shipping this stuff that came from the sea. It took a lot of time and effort to extract it. And then, you know, like a lot of people in the ancient world, they had a stroke of bad luck and was caught in a storm, and his ship sank um, off the coast of, of, uh, of Greece, um, off the coast of uh, nearby Athens. And so he saw this stuff dissolving back into the sea, where it had come from originally. It came from the sea, went back to the sea, you know, the impermanent. And how quickly all this time would just dissolve into the water and then it's completely gone, you know. And that, that really, that whole concept really drives home the idea of how, you know, even the things that we labor after and pre- cherish and prize so much can be incredibly transient and fragile under certain circumstances. So this incredibly precious thing, his whole career like his fortune was based on it, just poof, like dissolved back into the ocean. And he was lucky to escape with his life. And in, at least in one version of the story, he, he went to Delphi, which is near Athens, to consult with the oracle. And so the Delphic oracle famously gave these cryptic messages that were supposed to be messages directly from the god Apollo himself. And the most famous one, perhaps, is that uh, the Delphic oracle said that no man is wiser than Socrates, and Socrates went around trying to question that, and he, he said that this was the kind of inspiration for his philosophical mission. But Zeno did something similar. He went to the Oracle at Delphi, and it said to him that he should um, die himself with, uh, he should take on the colour of dead men, is what it said, which is a pretty eerie, you know, like, strange message to have got. So apparently he was chewing this over, trying to figure out what the hell that actually meant. And he plopped himself down at a bookseller's stall in the Agora in the middle of Athens. And by chance, he stumbled across this book, which is the Memorabilia Socrates by Xenophon, one of the followers of Socrates. And he read part of it, and he jumped up and said to the bookseller, where can I meet a man alive today like Socrates, who'd been executed a few generations earlier? And I think at that point, perhaps, he realized that what the oracle meant was that Rather than dying clothes with this purple dye, he was to begin to dye or colour his own mind, his own soul, with the wisdom, precepts of philosophers from previous generations, particularly Socrates, who seems to have become a, a, a hero for the Stoics. And so Zeno went off and trained in the Cynic philosophy and in other branches of Greek philosophy that were influenced by uh, Socrates. And then about 10 or 20 years later, he founded his own philosophical school, which was a, a kind of synthesis of all the different philosophies he'd studied at Athens. And that, that's where Stoicism came from. Wow. But just another anecdote about that, like, you know, five, we said five centuries later, Marcus Aurelius is still talking about dying things purple. And he, one of the most famous passages in the meditations, Marcus says that his precious, sacred, imperial purple robes are just uh, sheep's wool dyed in putrid shellfish gore. Like, so he's reminding himself that, you know, there's nothing special about this. You know, it's treated as if it's really important, but it's really just junk, you know, if I think about where it originally came from. Um, it's, it's rotten shellfish guts that, that are used to dye this stuff. But he's still using this as a kind of metaphor, and he... Marcus also talks about this idea of dyeing his mind, colouring his mind with the wisdom of, of ancient philosophers. So this is metaphor of dyeing things. It seems to have run all the way through the, the history of Stoicism. This founder was a dye merchant. And to think about you know the lives of these individuals thousands of years ago, that if they hadn't lived you know, and done what they did, you and I wouldn't be sitting here talking today, most likely. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, absolutely shaped our society. And in ways that people don't realize, you know, I find when I'm talking to people about stoicism, I noticed this very early on, that often people would say some of this stuff sounds kind of familiar. So it might be the names, they've kind of heard of Socrates vaguely and and stuff. They've kind of heard of Marcus Aurelius. And some of the ideas sound kind of vaguely familiar to them. And they've maybe even heard some of the phrases, like they've probably heard Carpe Deum, 
um, from uh, what's that, the Dead Poets Society, Robin Williams quotes it, doesn't he? And that's a quote from Horace, the Roman poet who'd studied Stoic philosophy. He sees the day, but it's got to do with this idea of like, living in a way that's grounded in, in the present moment, centred in the here and now. And so people have kind of assimilated some of these vague ideas and there's a kind of what I call a kind of sense of deja vu about it, but they don't realize all of these names and fragments were once woven together into a huge system of thought. I say it's like we're, we're, we're looking around us and we see these little pieces of rubble and we notice they've got some kind of engravings on them and things. And we think, oh, that's nice. It's interesting. And gradually we realize that we're standing in the grounds of what used to be a massive temple thousands of years ago. Like, but now it's just little pieces of rubble scattered around. But in our minds, we can kind of reconstruct what it once looked like. And that stoicism, we're kind of, everyone's kind of familiar with some of the fragments of it, but perhaps don't realize that it used to be a whole systematic way of life. Yeah, whole, yeah, that's right. That's exactly the words that came to mind as you were speaking them as a way, a way of life, a way of living. And, and this recognition that, you know, everything it seems comes to an end or all things have their time. And the notion of death as being one that's very important in Stoicism. And, and it sounds like from your introduction, from your life as well, where your father passed when you were 13. Mm -hmm. would, would, would you be willing to speak a little bit about how that shaped you and then also what you've learned from Stoicism and your study of philosophy about death that's made a difference in your life? I mean, you know, many people are bereaved like, and, you know, and the uh, and in their youth, and uh, you know, Marcus himself lost his father when he was about when Marcus was about three or four years old. We believe. So my father passed away from lung cancer when I when I was about thirteen or fourteen years old, and you know it had had for whatever reason it had a huge effect on my whole outlook on life, um, and it made me kind of preoccupied with the whole concept of of mortality. And it, it really it doesn't affect everyone this way, but it sent me on a quest for a philosophy of life and a kind of quest for meaning. And, you know, as it happens, the town that I come from, Ayr in Scotland, is the, the birthplace of, of Robert Burns, our national guard, who is a, a Freemason. And, and many of my friend's fathers in Scotland were Freemasons, and they, they didn't tell us a lot about it, but I knew that my father had this kind of philosophy of life that was tied in with the Old Testament and certain virtues or values and so on, certain forms of symbolism that happened to have been influenced by Greek philosophy as well. And after he passed away, uh, you know, I, I inherited some of his belongings, not a lot of stuff, his pipe rack and some books about Freemasonry that he had. And I started looking at them and I, I couldn't really make head or tail of them. But I saw, you know, mentions of, of uh the Old Testament and mentions of Pythagoras, the, the philosopher and so on. And that started me reading more about Christianity uh, and about also Gnostic uh, Christianity. And it got me looking at philosophy, New Age thought and all this kind of stuff. And as I read more and more, I became more interested in Plato and in Greek philosophy in general. I saw that as a, a kind of influence in the background shaping early Christianity. As we, we mentioned them. What, why do you think that that was the direction your interest took you instead of something else? I don't really know. I mean, I guess like um, it, it might have been right from the outset that I probably saw some references to Hellenistic culture and Greek philosophy in those Freemasonic books, perhaps. And then some of the New Age stuff I was reading was perhaps influenced by, by Greek philosophy. I read Alistair Crowley, you know, the, the occultist, and he talks a lot about Greek mythology and so on. So I think it was the kind of breadth of different influences I had and some poetry that I was reading guided me uh, to look at Christianity, but also to look at, at Greek philosophy and, and mythology as well. And, uh, I, you know, I got into Neoplatonic philosophy because that was a bigger influence on early Christianity. Um, if we, it, I became very interested in the uh, what's called the, the Nash Hammadi Library of um, Gnostic Christian texts. Um, so these are texts that were studied by early Christians, the scriptures that they had. And a, a little bit of trivia about that, in one of those volumes that contains these um, apocryphal uh, writings, these Gnostic Christian scriptures about the apostles and so on, 
one of them actually contains an excerpt from Plato's Republic. So, you know, in a parallel universe, you know, Christianity could have evolved to have had a Bible that had bits of Plato in it. You know, the early Christians had Bibles, as it were, that had Plato in them, like bits of Plato's Republic, where Socrates is talking about virtue. Then at some point, you know, the Council of Nicaea decided what was in and what was out in terms of Christian orthodoxy. And, you know, that Greek stuff was was removed like, from the collections of scriptures that Christians studied. But it, it was there for centuries as an integral part of what it meant to be a Christian. And so when I was reading about early Christianity, I realized that and I saw the connections you know, and I, and then I became more and more interested in the uh, the philosophy side of things, and kind of less interested in, in the religion, as it were. But philosophy as a way of life, I gradually rea- realized that ancient philosophy wasn't just this kind of bookish subject that we were saying a moment ago, but that it was actually about shaping your character and and living according to certain values. Marcus, as you mentioned already, was you know no stranger to death, and and I was really struck by the fact that he had, first of all, that he had 13 children (laughs) and that eight of them died. That as a parent, like you never want to experience the death of your children, but eight of them, it's like, oh my goodness. How, how do you think your life is different because of, because of this book? And I know this is a broader question, but also because of what you've learned you know, from stoicism as a way of life. I mean, clearly this is not just like a subject that you you know, researched and wrote a topic on, but it's, it is the path you're following. But what if you'd taken a different path? I mean, how is your life different because of it? And how is your life, and more specifically, perhaps, so how is your life different because you wrote this book? I mean, it's your sixth book. You wrote this one. How's it, how's your life different now? Well, I mean, to kind of refer back to something I mentioned in passing earlier, you know, like when I was a young guy, uh, I was, I kind of had multiple interests. I was kind of interested in philosophy. I was interested in Buddhism and meditation practices And I was kind of interested in Freud and psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and and sort of understanding the psyche. But I I kind of felt frustrated because these seemed like several balls that I was juggling and then they didn't kind of come neatly together for me. And I I tried to bring them together by studying existentialism, which kind of combined, the existential writers, some of them combined an interest in psychoanalysis with philosophy. But it didn't quite gel with me and and I I didn't see a, a a simple way of connecting it with meditation techniques and some of the other psychological self-help techniques that I've been studying. And then I stumbled across stoicism and it just kind of immediately clicked. You know, these distinct interests that I had all suddenly became one thing. Like they all fell under one heading for me. They were stoicism has the philosophy as a way of life. It has the psychological exercises that you can practice, like you might find in Buddhism, for example. And it's the basis of cognitive behavioral psychotherapy as well. It's the inspiration for modern cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. So it gave me, from my, I guess it would have been maybe 23 or 24 or something at the time, it suddenly brought everything together in a way that allowed me to make sense of my life. And it gave me a sense of direction. I felt a kind of sense of relaxation, a weight lifted from my shoulders almost. And that, that's been with me ever since. Like that, I I've had this kind of more relaxed feeling. You know, I, I'm less confused about things than I was when I was a teenager because it all came together for me at that point, and it, it gave me a way of coping with stress. I think, and also like we were saying, you know, the unexamined life is, is not worth living. And uh, famous slogan of Socrates, it gave me a kind of excuse to carry on applying philosophy in daily life, and you know, to go on this kind of quest for a deeper understanding that actually served a, a practical purpose in life. So, um, you know, it allowed me to to have a sense of direction and also a system within which I could dig deeper and deeper into understanding the world around me. And I say, I'd say fundamentally that's what it did for me, but also some of the techniques definitely helped me to cope with pain and to cope with anger and to cope with anxiety and uh, and I use those techniques also to help other people in my my work as a cognitive behavioral therapist. That's that's beautiful, and thank you for sharing that. It's I love hearing how stoicism has allowed you to weave these different threads of your life together in a way that not only benefits you, but you're able to share with others and benefit them as well. And somewhere in the book, you mentioned that that in fact these are spiritual practices. 
yeah. I mean, what you're talking about. And, and I love that toward the, toward the end of the book, once you've told these stories and explained kind of the setup that you start going through, not just what, what's the theory here, but what's the practice, like the things that we can learn and apply. And, and I do want to, I do want to ask you about a couple of those, like the view from above um, and that. But before before I do, the last person that I want to ask you about, and it's the last kind of what I see as the big story in the book, is this one about Cassius, Gaius Avidius Cassius. Yeah. And how he was someone that, if, as I understand this, and you could tell it better if you if you want, but that he, he basically became a rival to Marcus in mm-hmm. – not usurping power, but taking power, starting to gather people behind him. And that ultimately, uh, the, the part of this that I'd love to hear you explain as that unfolded is, is, is the way that Marcus handled that and the way that Marcus basically forgave, yeah. forgave him and had no consequences and what the impact of his leadership where he could have been very punitive, mm-hmm. but he took a totally different approach. And to me, that was like just next level leadership. I was like, that is awesome. Will you talk a little bit about this whole story that I just like very badly summarized? Actually, I think you summarized it pretty well. You know, like, so I, oh, let me say the thing that will confuse people a little bit is this idea. I think that you could have more than one emperor at the same time. So, so Marcus, for the first time, as we mentioned earlier, already had a co-emperor, Lucius Verus, and then he died. Um, and he was meant to be, he was kind of sent to the East to command the Roman legions in the the Parthian War, after the Parthians had invaded Armenia and triggered this war in the east, um, the Romans had to then liberate Armenia and defend the province of Syria. But the death of Lucius Verus kind of left a power vibe. two things did. First of all, as we mentioned earlier, Lucius was kind of stayed away from the action and delegated everything to his generals. So that kind of, like, one of the problems that that created was that it made his generals too powerful And it made them kind of rivals in a way. People, you know, would naturally look and think, well, why is this guy in charge? He seems pretty useless. He's just partying all the time. You know, the real heroes of this war are people like Avidius Cassius, who rose through the ranks and, you know, became this highly accomplished general, achieved these stunning victories in the East. And so people are looking at this guy thinking maybe he should be emperor instead of this loser that we've got is always drunk and partying, you know, to put it crudely. And this was a slow burning thing that went on for many years. And then a couple of other things happened. There was a huge uprising in Egypt and the legion who were garrisoned in Alexandria were defeated in battle by tribal warriors uh, who were attacking them. And uh, then uh, Lucius Verus had to take his legions and go and liberate uh, Alexandria from a siege. And in order to do that, he had to be granted imperium, which means that he had the authority for kind of because of a sort of legal quirk. He had to be granted the authority of an emperor throughout the eastern provinces, um, in the absence of the actual emperor. So now he's, you know, because of the way things have worked out, he's now in this position of being virtually an emperor himself. And so there's only really one other step for him to take, which is to be acclaimed emperor. Although, you know, Marcus is in power and doesn't want him to be acclaimed as emperor. Um, So he, in 175 AD, that's exactly what happened. The uh, Egyptian legion acclaimed, uh, it's down to the the army to acclaim the emperor. So they acclaimed, one of the legions acclaimed Avidius Cassius emperor. Now, technically, you had two emperors. Although Cassius was only emperor for about three months, you know, because the civil war was put down. And he was assassinated by his own officers. So, um, and we don't even have any statues of the guy. Like, you know, he's, he's kind of forgotten. But he was more of a military hawk. I, I, my reading of events is that Marcus was fighting the war slowly and the northern frontier. That Rome had been, the empire had been invaded by a, co- a huge coalition of barbarian or no- northern tribes. Um, who seized the opportunity to invade because the plague and the Parthian War had left the empire in a very weakened state, had left the, the legions depleted and greatly weakened. So all these northern tribes banded together and uh, crossed the Danube, crossed the Alps, and fought their way all the way down to Italy, onto almost the doorstep of Rome itself. It caused a huge panic in the empire. 
and uh, and Marcus had to fight them back and liberate the northern provinces. And th these wars went on uh, altogether for nearly 10 years uh, along the northern frontier. And I think the perception was that Marcus was putting too much emphasis on diplomacy and negotiation, but he was trying to stabilise the region for the longer term good, I would say. And so people thought he was too much of a dove. Um, he was playing too much of a long game, whereas guys like Avidius Cassius probably just wanted to march up there and slaughter everybody and put them down by force. Um, so there's this kind of tension between two military policies, I think. And uh, there was an uprising, and uh, Marcus, we're told, gave this quite remarkable speech. It's reported by a Roman senator and historian called Cassius Dio, and he gives us the full text of a speech supposedly given by Marcus to his troops, where he basically says a number of quite shocking things. He, the news had already reached Rome of this uprising and the Senate in Rome had freaked out. Uh, they exhibited a kind of knee-jerk response. They declared Ovidius Cassius a public enemy. They seized his assets. And that just escalated things. So the population in Rome thought, now he's going to invade Rome and sack the city. So everybody was panicking. And it would have taken a couple, a couple of weeks for the news to get all the way to Austria, to the northern frontier, by courier, uh, and uh, for Marcus to find out what, what else was going on at the other side of the empire. And, and he did the opposite of what the Senate did. Uh, he gave a speech where he officially stated, not only, first of all, he prefaced it by saying, if I'd known about this earlier, that someone was impeaching my authority as emperor, uh, I would have voluntarily stepped down and appealed in front of a Senate hearing in order to hear out Cassius's objections against me and answer them, and I would have let the Senate decide, which is a remarkable thing to say. Again, you know, some people might want to you know, consider parallels with, with contemporary politics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, many, many, many people. In my phraseology, <laughs> that, but he... Um, he said, look, I'd be willing to step down and appear in front of a Senate hearing and, and you know, let's talk it through. Um, but he uh, he said, look, it's too late for that now because uh, uh, Cassius is threatening to invade Rome, like the war's escalating. But he said, I, I, you know, I'm going to pardon everybody that's involved in the uprising against me. And like, the exception would be, like, apart from people who have committed serious crimes, he said, you know, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to assume that Cassius believes that what he's doing is the right thing. And in doing that, he's referring to something he mentions many times in the meditations. And it's a controversial idea that goes all the way back to Socrates, the sort of granddaddy of Stoicism. And Socrates famously or notoriously said, no man does evil knowingly, and therefore no man does evil willingly. Right? Because everybody believes that what they're doing is right in some sense. You know, yeah. but Socrates said, people don't do bad things just because they're kind of willfully malicious. Like, but in some sense, at some level, either they believe that what they're doing is acceptable or trivial or that it's actually justified and right. And that's why Marcus says, you know, if you challenge people and say what you're doing is unethical, people will usually be really offended by that right? because they believe that what they're doing is justified normally. And Cassius believed that what he was doing was justified. So Marcus said, I'm view as a Stoic, I view this more not so much as kind of deliberate malice, but more as a misunderstanding, like as a moral error of judgment, as it were. And so then my obligation is to try and educate the guy and thrash things out rationally rather than just take revenge on him or something like that. So I'm going to pardon him. I'm going to offer to discuss it, you know, and that would have shocked the troops gathered in front of him. They would have thought this is a bizarre thing to do. And the person yeah. that it freaked out the most was his son, Commodus, um, who we're told thought that they should have had all of the the, uh, the traitors or usurpers executed. And in fact, after Marcus died, and Marcus was as good as his word, he even protected the family of Avidius Cassius, and he did pardon everybody that was involved in the uprising. But as soon as Marcus died, his son Commodus, who succeeded him as emperor, had uh, everyone involved in the uprising hunted down and burned alive at the stake as, as traitors, doing the opposite of what his, his father's teaching uh, was. So the Stoics say that um, the essence of anger is the desire for revenge. And they said this is unphilosophical, it's irrational. You know, if we disagree with what other people are doing, our fundamental goal, insofar as possible, should be, try, it should be to try and educate them and arrive at mutual understanding, not just to punish them for the sake of it.
there, there's so much wisdom in that. I think in the humility that is in Marcus's statements and that willingness to forgive, you know, as the initial response and, and to talk it through. And, and one thing that I, I was impressed by in this story is where you mentioned that Cassius was assassinated. He was killed by his own men. Yeah. And when I looked at that, and you might've pointed this out in the book, but about how men who knew that they would be forgiven yeah. were more likely to kill the guy that, you know, is, I'm not saying that very well, but I think they probably wouldn't have killed him if they all had their backs against the wall, knowing they were all going to be, you know, hung, hanged or burned. Uh-huh. But because Marcus had given this blanket, basically this blanket forgiveness, yeah. Cassius' own men were like, no, nah, why are we doing this? And then killed him. They had no so, more whoa. reason to fight. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe the only person that wanted to, to, like, to have a pitched battle with the, the, the Imperial army was, was Cassius. So they, I think they looked around and thought, look, dude, you're the only guy that wants to have this fight. You know, and apparently <laughs> you won't back down. So like, they ambushed him and cut his head off. Um, and then they delivered it in a bag to Marcus and said, the war's over. Like, you know, we're, we're hoping that you're going to be as good as your word and forgive us. And, and he did. He said everyone, you know, go back like, home to your, you know, your, your garrison, your, uh, your cities and, uh, you know, let's go back to normal. And, and he, he toured all the regions to try and smooth things over. Um, I mean, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. But yeah, they, they obviously see. Cassius was renowned for instil- he, he had a reputation as a general for being extremely strict and he instilled he was very good at instilling discipline in troops that lacked discipline but he did it by terrorizing them and punishing them very severely which kind of worked but it meant that those men weren't particularly loyal to him when it was put to the test you know they were scared of him like but that only goes so far like you know, and and when they saw the opportunity to finish him, then they weren't scared of him anymore. Like they thought, uh, like they would take their chance. Whereas Marcus commanded loyalty from his troops, not through fear, but because of respect. They loved him rather than fearing him, and so they were more likely to risk their lives for him because they actually believed in what he represented. I think there really are so many modern day leadership lessons in that. You know, about like you're saying, fear and intimidation will only get you so far. And many people might want to kill you. So, <laughs> so look out. And Marcus, by the way, when you said that they brought, they brought him Cassius's head in a bag, as you tell it, he didn't even want to look at it. He was like, just go bury it. Yeah. He said that he didn't want to kind of celebrate. He felt that he'd been, he said that he felt that he'd been robbed of the opportunity to sort things out like, with, with mm-hmm. Cassius and resolve things rationally. Um, so I, I think he was very saddened that that had happened, uh, you know. Uh, but that was the, the way that it worked. He would have rather had the opportunity uh, to to resolve things and smooth things over. Um, Epictetus, funny. Here's a little aside, by the way. The philosopher Epictetus is an, uh, the most famous Stoic teacher, and the the main philosopher that Marcus seems to be following. Marcus would never have met him. But Marcus's teachers probably met and studied under Epictetus. And he quotes Epictetus more than any other philosopher. And we know he'd studied his, his writings, the discourses. Epictetus says many strange things, many, many striking things. But one of the odd things that he says, he talks to his students very often. We have these transcripts of discussions that he had with his students. And he's always talking to them about Socrates. And one of the things he says to them is that the main thing that they could learn from Socrates isn't his philosophical method or the ideas that he has about virtue, the the sort of things that you might assume he would say. He said the main thing you guys could learn from Socrates is his ability to resolve quarrels. Like Socrates was renowned for being able to smooth over arguments. And that's probably because he was asking people very challenging questions about their most cherished beliefs. The sort of thing that could be really irritating uh, and, and would upset people, but he was also very good at remaining friendly with them. He was good at really challenging people without upsetting them and, and smoothing things over when people did get their feathers ruffled. And Epictetus said one of the main things you could learn from this guy is actually his ability to quell arguments and remain friends with people. And this is something that most people don't associate with ancient philosophy, but friendship 
and the the ability to show that exhibit these kind of social skills was integral to many forms of ancient philosophy. It's something that the Stoics really prized. Uh, so that goes all the way from Socrates right down to Marcus Aurelius, this desire and, and a sense of an obligation to maintain and cultivate friendships. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's so beautiful and doing it in a way that's not just acquiescing. It's not just being a pleaser, but it's actually, you know, being firm in who you are and clear about what your values are while not, you know, grappling with, not retaliating against, but, you know, in some ways playing with, receiving, challenging, but also that's, I mean, there's a real gift in that. It's a skill. It's awesome. Yeah, actually, there's a point at which Socrates implies that the, you know, the, the real way to, to cultivate love between friends isn't just by complimenting people. He says this to two young boys that he's, that are very close friends and he's talking to them about the nature of friendships, a, a dialogue called the Carmides. And he says, um, you know, like the real way to cultivate friendships is actually to challenge your friends, but to do it in an appropriate manner. So they feel as if you're, they're being improved by your company and friendship, not just kind of dishing out compliments all the time, which anybody can do. There's some, there is some wisdom in that for sure. And, and what, what I'm impressed by too, having these conversations now, I know I alluded to this earlier, but the fact that these are real people, real places, real events, you know, as far as we know, all of this. And now if you go to these places in Europe, I mean, yeah, there's some historical, some very significant historical locations and things, but man, there's a lot of glass and asphalt and steel buildings. And I think sometimes as a society, we live as though we're the only society that has ever lived, that will ever live. And I just, I'm really grateful that you're bringing these principles and these ideas to a broader audience, because I think it's pretty evident the way we're living as a society isn't working and we need something else. And even if we find it, you know, in, in the annals of history, it, it doesn't matter where it comes from, I suppose, but this, this has a lot of potential to help, to help people. It is helping people already, myself included. I want to ask if you will share a, a bit about this, the view from above. Mm-hmm. To me, that was like, man, that is so simple, but so powerful. Will you talk about what it is, how we could use it, why we might want to, that kind of thing? Well, the Stoics have lots of psychological techniques. And one of the things that attracted me to them is that they they placed more, most schools of ancient philosophy from before Socrates even, um, but certainly from Socrates onwards, uh, all the, most of these schools of ancient philosophy employ a number of metaphors to describe philosophy and what they're doing. And one of them is a medical metaphor. So philosophy is a therapy. They actually call it a therapy for the soul. Marcus Aurelius says that his main Stoic mentor, Junius Rusticus, convinced him that he needed therapy, therapeia, that is the Greek word. So some people say, well, we're reading these Stoics and making them, you know, kind of through the lens of modern therapy, but they had this concept very explicitly. They had the terminology and the concept of, uh, of philosophy as a psychological therapy um, based on a, a medical model. And so in, in my first book in Stoicism, I listed some of the psychological techniques that they, they show. Um, there are about 18 or so distinct psychological techniques, a whole bunch of them that the Stoics talk about, depending on how you choose to divide them up. And many of them have parallels in modern psychotherapy. So I wrote about that particularly parallels in cognitive behavioral therapy. But one that doesn't really have a common parallel in modern psychotherapy is the view from above. So often we don't know the names of the techniques. This is a name that a modern scholar, Pierre Hadot, a French academic, used to describe a technique that's very common in Stoicism, particularly in Marcus Aurelius, and also to some extent in in other branches of, of Hellenistic philosophy. So the view from above takes a couple of different forms, but one is uh, Marcus talks about viewing events as if seen from a high watchtower overhead or as uh, from a helicopter view, we might say today. And I think that's there are two things that that reminds me of. One is the way we think of the Greek gods looking down from Mount Olympus. So it's a godlike perspective, looking down on human events as if we're looking at ants scuttling around beneath us. And uh, the other thing that it only recently dawned on me, although this is kind of glaringly obvious, um, that in Athens, there's a, a high up part of the city called the Acropolis. And there's like many city, ancient cities, there's a hill in the middle and the, the town or city grew up around that. And there's a temple to Athena 
uh, on top of the, the hill. There's a number of uh, temples and sacred buildings up there. So the ancient Athenians would have been very familiar with the view from the Acropolis, which is very similar to the way that Marcus Aurelius describes this view from above, looking down on law courts and uh, traders, people buying and selling things, people getting married and uh, you know, people arguing in courts of law, and so all human life down there milling around like ants beneath. This is exactly what you see, the view of the Agora uh, from the Acropolis in Athens. So I think um, this perspective was familiar in the ancient world, and people instinctively knew that when you view things like that, you picture them in a broader context, so they seem less imminent and less distressing, and there's a sense of serenity that you achieve from this kind of high up, elevated perspective and events. And that's perhaps why the Acropolis was considered a, a sacred area, uh, an area inhabited by the gods. But it also dovetails with ancient cosmology. So the Stoics and other philosophers were interested in the nature of the universe as a whole and trying to understand what was called ancient physics, like cosmology, we would probably call it today. And they thought if we can try and envisage the whole of space and time, like trying to have that concept and hold it in our mind would be as close as we could get to empathizing with or entering into the mind of God himself, the mind of Zeus. What's it like to be Zeus? He has a vision of the totality of space and time. So we can kind of stretch our minds to try and grasp that. We can't picture it in the way that they imagine that Zeus might, but we have the vague idea. We can kind of get a hint of infinity and eternity in our, in our mind. And they thought that when we stretch ourselves in that way, we achieve a kind of detached perspective, a sense of philosophical serenity towards the events in life. It, it forces us to engage with the impermanence of things, the limitations of our material existence and our own mortality. So it brings together several major philosophical themes, if you like, in one grand contemplative vision. So is the idea, I mean, I know you, you just described it about like envisioning from above a helicopter or a higher place, but is this in, in advance of something? Like if I'm going to have a difficult conversation with my boss or is it something that happened in the past that was really distressing that I go back and replay from above and try to get some distance from or like how, how would the Stoics have used it or how could we use it to make a difference for our, ourselves? I think it could be either, actually. I mean, mainly they seem to be implying it, it's used to deal with events that are already bothering us. But it could also be used on a regular basis. Marcus, actually, he says this about several things in the meditations. He, he frequently says, um, you know, uh, to he will describe a psychological exercise or a perspective, and, and he'll tell himself to do this frequently or to do this on a daily basis. So this seems to have been a regular practice, right? Not just a kind of coping skill, but maybe something that he did every day, perhaps. He's a bit vague about it, but it yeah. sounds like it may have been something that was done on a kind of systematic, regular basis. So that would imply it's done perhaps in anticipation of events, but also, I think, as a way of coping with things that have already happened. Uh, as an aside, like our most... Um, it's not well known today, actually, although I, I, I recently just kind of had to, to read a new translation of what was once one of the most famous passages from classical philosophy. And it's a passage from a book called The Republic by Cicero. Um, and this passage from The Republic is called The Dream of Scipio. It's about Scipio Africanus, a Roman general. And it's a beautiful, sh relatively short uh, piece of writing. And it describes this Roman general um, falling asleep and having a dream in which he ascends into the heavens and, and talks to one of his ancestors, who was also a, a very uh, a important Roman general. And he's looking down from the sky on Africa, uh, the north of Africa, and the Roman legions fighting uh, the Carthaginians, which is a war that he was engaged with. And he describes this kind of mystical, metaphysical vision. So this the uh, piece of writing, the Dream of Scipio, is, is one of the most was one of the most iconic and famous examples of the way the view from above is very beautifully described. But it's in Marcus Aurelius, and it's scattered throughout many other pieces of classical literature as well. That's cool. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, I want to turn our conversation now to the enlightening lightning round. So, in this section, I will ask you probably eight or nine questions. 
You're welcome to answer as long as you want. My intent is to ask the question briefly and then be quiet. <laughs> okay, for the most part. All right. So, question number one. Please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a... I think I would say that um, life is life is like a, a game or a sport. Like a, when you're competing against another team, or the Stoics would say a wrestling match, where events are sent to test us, like a, a, an opponent in a, a, a match or a sparring partner. And this is how the Stoics like to describe things. Marcus, who in his youth, uh, trained as a boxer and a wrestler uh, and uh, fought gladiators using weapons and was very familiar with this way of looking at things. And in the meditations, decades later, he says, look, when someone does something to offend you, rather than taking it really personally, view it in the same way that you would if you got, you know, a kind of like hit in the face or scratched during a wrestling match. Like you don't get upset about it, you know. You 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 just treat it in a sportsman like manner. You know, you continue to engage with the fight, and you're just careful to not to let your opponent do it again. Like so, you prepare for it, you deal with it, but you don't get overly upset about it. You treat it kind of like a sport or a game. And Marcus would say, "Well, this is how you should view the the catastrophes that you're facing during your reign. Like there are challenges sent to test you, as it were." Like there are opportunities for you to show your strength of character and virtue and to improve as an individual by treating them as practice, you know, as character building, if you like. I love that view. All right. Question number two. What's something at which you wish you were better? Something at which I wish I was better. Well, this is, maybe this is going to seem like a, a strange answer. I wish I was a better writer. Um, you know, I kind of stumbled into writing. When I was a kid, I really enjoyed writing. And then I kind of forgot about it. And it was kind of by accident that I got into writing books and stuff. And I started off doing it really as just a way of getting my own thoughts clear on paper. And then as I wrote, you know, several books, like I'm, I'm working on my seventh book now, which is a graphic novel. I'm having to kind of take it more seriously as I kind of progress. Like it started off as a hobby and now it's become my, uh, you know, part of my career as a way, uh, in a way. And so, I, you know, I, I'm starting to have to think more seriously about writing uh, in a way that engages the reader and what readers expect and, you know, how to use various techniques to, to, to make the writing uh, more, uh, like more engaging and uh, more informative. Uh, so I, it's like a never-ending process. It was never my yeah. plan, really, to become a writer, <laughs> and so I'm yeah. kinda, I feel like I'm sort of catching up with myself a little bit. That's a pattern I see in all the most successful whatevers, the most successful entrepreneurs. I never meant to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> entertainers. I never thought I would do this. Yeah. So tell me about the graphic novel. Oh, it's about Marcus Aurelius as well. I mean, it was kind of by accident, really. You know, I read a lot of comics as a kid, and I loved them, and then since then, I've never really. Be, you know, read many graphic novels and stuff, and uh, I, I I met an artist who wanted to do some comics for me. So we did three web comics about Marcus Aurelius, and they centered around Aesop's Fables, and uh, kind of relating those to Stoic teachings. So there's a little depiction of some stories about animals embedded within a uh, an enclosing story about Marcus Aurelius and his use of philosophy. And then, uh, you know, I basically cut a long story short. The publisher saw those and said, could you do a graphic novel? Wow. By chance, I, I wound up being offered a, a contract to, to with a major publisher to do a, a graphic novel about Marcus Aurelius. So I'm currently reading Stan Lee's book on nice. how to write scripts for, gra- for comic books and graphic novels and trying to learn a little bit more about the art of, of doing that. But I'm, I'm super excited about doing it because I want to do something that would reach a wider audience, maybe a slightly younger demographic, and for people to kind of engage with these ideas in a, a format that, you know, is very different from the way that they're usually presented. Yeah, that's great. I look forward to that. That's pretty cool. Okay, question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a T-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? If I had to wear, um, well, maybe it would say the unexamined life is not worth living. I think that's one of my favorite quotes from Socrates. 
or one of my favourite quotes from the Stoics is it's not things that upset us but our opinions about them. That's a pretty that's the thing that kind of ties Stoicism to cognitive therapy. The early cognitive therapists used to teach that quote from Epictetus to most of their clients. So I guess that those would be two easy options for me, one from Socrates and one from the Stoics. But there are many there are probably many ways that I could choose. Oh yeah. Well that reminds me, and I thought it was something I read in your book. It just kind of brought that up for me. What's that isn't it a Marcus Aurelius saying life is opinion, something, something? Yeah. He says the universe has changed, life is opinion. The universe has changed, life is opinion. That yeah. Those are two of his favorite ideas. There are themes that run through the meditation. It's kind of hard to explain, but in the Greek, it's like um, just really like four words or six words. Um, so it's very, very condensed. But he, he's clearly referring to Heraclitus and the doctrine Pantare, like uh, the impermanence of all things, everything flows. The, the universe has changed. You know, everything is impermanent. Nothing lasts forever. And life is opinion. By that, he means that the Stoic doctrine from Epictetus, that it's our opinions, particularly our value judgments, that determine our quality of life because they shape our emotions. So these are his two favorite philosophical teachings that he combines in this little pithy slogan. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. Well, and on that topic, this is the other thing I wanted to ask back in the last section, but now it came up here, I'll, I'll ask you here, which is about emotion. And, and this term that you phrased, like, and I know these were in Greek and the translation probably isn't due justice to the concept being articulated and things like this, but uh, the Greek or the Roman, the Latin, whatever, this term of proto-passions, mm -hmm. that things arise like they're going to when we're startled, when, you know, something surprises, whatever, and mm -hmm. something arises, but then there's a, a choice. There's a moment of awareness, a moment of choice. Will you just, will you just talk about what was the view of this kind of emotional mastery and this idea that at some level emotions just arise and we can't control them, but there comes a point where we can. Well, you know, uh, the word that the Greeks use is propathei, which is hard to translate, but it, it kind of means the initial, the beginning of an emotion, or that we it's translated as proto passions often by scholars. It's a pretty clunky term, right? It means the yeah. the initial automatic emotional reflex that we have before we've even had a chance to think about what's going on. And I, th I think of that as being probably the, partly the Stoics were responding to criticisms. So probably people said, well, hang on a minute, buddy. Like, not all of our emotions are, are under our voluntary control. You can't just, even the wise man, surely, if someone runs up behind him and goes, boo, you know, he's kind of jump, like his heart rate is going to go up and stuff like that. I can't control all of these emotions. And I think the Stoics would have said, well, okay, yeah, all, obviously it's common sense that some aspects of our emotion are involuntary, reflex-like, automatic, and not under our voluntary control. Even the enlightened sage, someone with a, a strong character who's completely you know, in control of their, their own uh, opinions and value judgments is going to have certain automatic emotional reactions to sudden shocks and things like that. And, you know, like, uh, there's a famous anecdote in a, a, a Roman writer called Aulus Gellius um, about how he was on a boat once and it was caught in a storm and there was a Stoic philosopher, an unnamed famous Stoic philosopher on the boat. And everyone was freaking out and panicking and crying and, you know, pleading to the gods for mercy. They all thought they were going to drown. And uh, the Stoic philosopher was silent, but he was shaking and he looked frightened. So when they got safely to shore, uh, Gellius said to this guy, look, you know, I know who you are. You're like a famous Stoic. So how come you look scared? I mean, fair play, you weren't freaking out like everyone else, but, you know, you look like you were going to throw up and you turned quite pale. Like, so, you know, you were obviously, you know, almost as frightened as the rest of us. And the guy explained to him, well, the Stoics say that we have invol even a seasoned sailor would have turned pale and been shaking in the middle of that storm, right? Um, and he goes, you know, certainly a passenger who's not used to it would automatically. But the difference is that I don't continue to complain about it afterwards. Like, I don't dwell on it or amplify the anxiety by continuing to catastrophize and, like, tell myself, like, it was awful and so on. You know, I allow myself to experience the fear. I accept the fact that I'm shaking. Like, and, I, you know, I take a step back from it. 
and that's the difference. That's what stoicism will do for you. But the really striking thing about that is the way the Stoics conceptualize this happens to be very similar to modern cognitive theories of emotion, which also recognize that there's this kind of what we would call an automatic um, phase in our emotional reaction that's followed by a voluntary or a strategic phase in which we start telling ourselves stuff about our emotions and imposing beliefs on them that either damp them down or amplify them or distort them in some way. And that's where we can do therapy. Like we can't necessarily stop the initial response, although there might be some things we can do to modify that, like, you know, through repeated exposure or confronting a situation many times. We we might get desensitized or used to it. But we can change what we say to ourselves about the situation, how much we worry about it, you know, how much we exaggerate it in our mind. And that's something we can learn to deal with more rationally. Yeah, that that's something I, I want to learn to be able to do more fully, more easily. And to be honest, I want others to, too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was me breaking my own enlightening lightning round rule by going deeper into something. But thank you for exploring that. I, I think listeners will benefit from that. And I enjoy it, too. OK, next question. What book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Oh, gosh, really? Um, that, uh, these are great questions, actually. You know, I, it takes me a minute to think of the answers, but I suppose there would be books on stoicism. Um, and as a therapist, I've, I've recommended, you know, part of my job is recommending books to clients, actually. They tend to be evidence-based self-help books for therapy. Um, I, a book that I, I recommended a lot as a therapist was The Worry Cure by Robert Leahy. It's a little bit dated now, but I've, there's a big demand actually for books that help people to deal with worrying, the process of worrying. And that's one of the few books that deals with it quite well, although it's a little bit old now. And uh, I, I often recommend books on stoicism, like particularly, uh, I like to recommend The Daily Stoic to people, which is uh, probably, I think at the moment, the best selling book on stoicism. It's co-authored by Ryan Hodge and Stephen Hanselman. And so it's kind of got like a little reading for each day of the year and a uh, commentary on it. Like, yeah. And Hanselman, he's, is he your, he's an agent too, right? Auth- my, author agent. Yeah. And he's also the co-author of that book. Yeah. That's awesome. He did the translations actually. Steve's a bit of a scholar and he, he translated the, the stoic texts for that book. And then Ryan contributed the commentary on them. Cool. Okay. Question number five. So you travel a lot. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Well, this is a great question as well. Like I, you know, I can, I've got good answers, I think, to all these questions. The, I can tell you straight off the bat, my favorite thing that I take with me when I'm traveling, um, I, well, there are two things, right? Um, I take a skipping rope everywhere. Right, because really? uh, the you know I found when I was traveling I get frustrated that I wouldn't always be able to go to the gym and stuff, and uh, I I realized that it takes a bit of practice to get into jumping rope. I've had quite a few injuries from it. I've pulled my calf muscle quite you know, my Achilles tendon a few times. But once you it's like playing a musical instrument. Once you get used to skipping or jumping rope, um, then I I just love the fact that you just need a rope that you can wind up and stick in your backpack and take anywhere in the world with you. And as long as I can clear some space in a hotel room or you know an Airbnb or whatever, or I can go to a park or something, I just take my rope with me and I, you know, I can just jump rope for ten minutes a day and, you know, do some other exercises and stuff and I, I don't have to find a gym to go to or whatever. It's I love the fact that it's really cheap and portable. I guess maybe that's my Scottishness. I like things that are super, you know, incredibly cheap. It costs five bucks for a skipping rope. <laughs> Is there any kind of brand that you look for or any characteristics of, of a skipping rope that you, you seek out? I don't really know, but I've been through a few. You know, I, I was quite fussy about it. I had about four before I found one that I, I really liked. But I can't, I'm not sure what, what brand it is. Um, but yeah, you just have to adjust them so that they're the right length. And like I say, it takes a little bit of practice to get into it. But also what I find is I love to listen to soul music, like Northern soul, like up-tempo soul music when I'm, I'm skipping. And then it becomes almost like once you get into the room of it, it's almost like you're kind of like dancing to the music. You know, you can jump a lot from side to side and time the music and stuff. So it's, it becomes quite, you know, it's kind of fun. And my little girl loves it. Like, so she likes to kind of like watch me skipping and have a go at it ourselves. Like. That's awesome. 
I wonder how the hotel guests on the floor below you feel. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, even there's things you can do to help a little bit with that. Like I used to, I also sometimes I'll take a yoga mat with me and then I'll, I'll put that down so you know, there's not as much impact. But yeah, it's better if, it, if it's not a wooden floor and you're up above somebody else. There's not as much impact noise if you have a mat or a carpet or something. You're the first guest in more than 50 guests who said either of those two things. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, next question. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Oh, gosh, in order to live. Yeah, um, it's kind of easy to answer as well. Like there's a bunch of things that Stoics, so I'm almost reluctant to say these because they're, they're, they've kind of become cliches for modern Stoics. I do find myself talking about them a bit, though, because people ask about them. So I, I'll usually take cold showers, um, like once or twice a day, which in the summer here, we're having a bit of a heat wave at the moment, so that's not too onerous right now. But in Nova Scotia in the winter, it was a little bit more challenging. Like, it's pretty cold. Thing. But I found that once I got used to doing it, two things are, like, you know, people, a lot of people nowadays like to have a cup of coffee to wake themselves up in the morning. I, I get much more um, of a wake up from having a cold shower. So I'm like, if I don't have it, then I kind of feel a little bit lethargic or groggy by comparison. So I I, I start to kind of, you know, crave it in a way of really, you know, giving myself a jolt, a jolt in the morning, coming more fully alert, more awake. So something I'll, I'll do is have cold showers, and I feel that that's benefited my health. And also, I notice in in Canada in the winter that some of my friends are wrapped up in their, their jackets and things and I'll still be walking around in a t-shirt because it's I know I seem to be less bothered by the cold and then the uh, the other thing is that I, the other cliched stoic thing is that I usually fast I do intermittent fasting so normally just for like one or two days at a time like and maybe once or twice a week but I find it really easy to do I think that for me the thing about fasting is the first few times you do it you're kind of thinking about it too much and you know, you think, oh, how long has it been now since I haven't eaten? And the fact you're thinking about food makes you kind of hungry. But once you've done it for a while, it just becomes second nature and you don't think about food. So I guess everyone's metabolism is different, but I can go two or three days and I barely even like, register the fact that I'm, I'm fasting. It doesn't seem like a, a big problem to me. It seems pretty easy to do. And... Um, like uh, the science is solid. There's a number of RCTs, randomized control trials, that show intermittent fasting can be really good for you. Um, but also personally, I've been doing it for decades now, and I know that if I go through periods where I stop doing it, I definitely feel much less healthy. I feel a lot healthier um, when I'm fasting. I lost a lot of weight from fasting, and uh, I kind of feel less bloated and stuff. I feel it's kind of improved my digestion and benefited my health, and also save a lot of money. <laughs> I yeah, spend as much on my shopping bill. So that's great. Yeah, fasting and cold showers. Like, that's a stoic way. What's one thing you wish every American knew? Oh, uh, like, you know, uh, I've got an answer to that as well. I don't know if it's really a stoic thing. It kind of ties in a bit with stoicism. It's more related to CBT. I wish everybody knew more about how fear and anxiety function psychologically. Um, it's this kind of cliche thing of we should teach this to school kids. You know, I think children should learn how more about how their emotions work and how to, to manage their feelings. And, like, the thing that we know most about really is anxiety. Like, you know, um, psychotherapy has varying results for different types of problems. You know, it's not a level playing field. So depression, for example, is kind of hard to treat. Um, you know, we, we have relatively modest success, success rates in treating clinical depression. But for things like uh, what we call specific phobias, like an animal phobia or whatever, we have really high success rates, like 90% success rate in a very relatively short space of time, maybe even, you know, just a few hours of treatment. Then we've known for half a century now pretty much how phobic anxiety works and other forms of anxiety are kind of a little bit more complicated, but related to that. So I wish everybody knew more about the, how anxiety functions, the, um, the different forms that anxiety takes, and uh, you know how we, we can actually overcome anxiety. Uh, I can tell you in one minute, like uh, it, it, you know, it's common sense in a, in a way. Um, so, like, if you take someone who has a cat phobia and put them put them in a room with a bunch of cats, 
their heart rate will approximately double within the first five seconds or so, as if they were running really hard. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell a client that and I'll say, what happens next? And they'll look a bit confused for a minute and they'll say, I don't know. I mean, I'll say they'll want to leave the room, but what happens if they don't? Like if for some reason they stay in the room with the cats and then they might say, well, you know, what goes up must come down. I guess the heart rate's going to have to reduce. I'll say, how long does that take? It might take 10, 15, 20 minutes. It's going to vary a little bit, but roughly in that kind of time frame. And then if they do the same thing again the next day, their heart rate will go up, but not as high as it did before, and it'll reduce more quickly, and the same the next day, and the same the next day, until it levels off pretty much, and they extinguish or habituate their anxiety. So there's a natural wearing off of anxiety when we confront the thing that we're frightened of for long enough under controlled conditions basically and the reason most people don't realize that is that when we're anxious we have an overwhelming urge to avoid the thing that's provoking the anxiety and what would reverse that would be if a parent or a coach or a therapist was with us encouraging us to ride it out so the main thing is the presence of another person encouraging us to stay in the situation and when we do that usually anxiety habituates or it wears off in layman's terms and we know that more reliably than just about anything else in the whole field of research and psychotherapy and we've known it for over half a century now so i think every american in fact everyone particularly young children should should learn that simple robust fact about how anxiety works and how we can overcome it yeah, we'd, we'd be a healthier society for sure. The next question is about relationships. Oh. It's about what's the most useful or the most important relationship advice you've ever received and successfully applied? The most important relationship advice. Um, the most important relationship advice that I can give, I'm not sure where I got it from. I guess I probably got it somewhere over the years from books or training or talking to other therapists and so on and, and, and it really comes from you know I feel like a lot of what I've learned about relationships comes from um had my relationship with my daughter like I think of you know had the, it's a privilege to have the opportunity in life to have children and then you know when we if we're if we have the opportunity to have children it, it's like a, a great chance to learn so much more about ourselves and about people and relationships in general like it's um it, it condenses so many things it's like a little you know uh, a perfect opportunity to learn more about about relationships i think and um you know the thing i, I learned really about kids uh, and that applies to people in general is you know to make a point of asking people um how they feel, you know, not to take things for granted. So I would say to my daughter, you know, like, what's the most annoying thing that I do? Um, like, you know, I might say yesterday, you know, there was something that, that, that upset you, you know, what, like, what would you like me to do or say if that happens again? And, you know, to make space to talk about feelings and to discuss it in a matter-of-fact way. And to do that, you have to pick your time. So you can't do it when somebody's in the middle of feeling really upset. You know, it's often easier to do it the, next, the following day and say, you know, like, you know, yesterday when we kind of like had that little argument or whatever and, you know, you got annoyed with me. Like, well, like how do you think I could have handled that better? Like, and so it becomes a collaboration. Like, you know, how can we kind of get past that? And that, I think that applies to you know relationships in general like it's just a point of picking a time when it feels appropriate and both of you can take a step back from a situation and discuss collaboratively how you can learn from it and deal with it better and i think many people just like maybe don't really take the time to do that but you know it, it, well for example my daughter once said to me you know when she was really kind of upset and just having a, a tantrum like a, like a five-year-old a six-year-old like would often do probably about, you know tying our shoelaces or some you know putting our jacket on to go out in the snow like um and i said to her you know what do you want me to do and she said well um like when you talk and you're asking me questions it's kind of overwhelming and that makes me more upset so i'm kind of trying to help her and stuff but the fact that i'm talking and saying too much stuff is kind of like frying her brain a bit because she's already kind of tearful and i said well do you want me to go in another room and leave you and she says no i want you to stay with me but not kind of like 
kind of hit me with as many questions and stuff because it feels like it's too much. And I, and then I, I, I thought, well, I, I didn't understand that. Like, so now I understand how you're feeling. Right? It's much easier to know how to deal with it. It's one of those things that sound like it's so simple, yeah. but until you ask, you don't know, yeah. <laughs> right? And I believe in general, feedback is king, you know, in terms of teaching and designing courses and writing books. You know, we'll talk about the creative process, but I am a great believer in, and it takes courage to obtain feedback from other people. And, you know, obtaining feedback in relationships is the same. You know, you've got to make an effort um, and, you know, have the courage to ask other people what they think of how you're acting and, and being and then listen to what they say. Thank you. Okay. So the last question in the enlightening lightning round deals with money, which is aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you do or don't do with it? I don't spend it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my friends is back in Scotland, this old guy you're back in Scotland, he used to say, you'll never have money if you keep spending it. But, you know, of course, I, that's kind of what it's for. But I, I don't really spend a lot of money. You know, the, the things I spend money on don't really change that much. Um, you know, well, at times in my life when I'm earning more money or I have more money, I don't go out and suddenly buy more expensive clothes or more expensive food. You know, like I, I have fairly simple pleasures in life. And uh, we, You, you I, take I, cold showers? You're saving money on heating water? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't spend a lot. The computer that I'm using just now is like um, I got from a pawnbroker, and I like I use Linux instead of Windows, um, so it runs faster than a, like a Windows laptop might be. It allows me to use older technology for longer. Um, so I, you know, I, I kind of like economizing and figuring out little workarounds and stuff. My skipping rope is a lot cheaper than renting a treadmill or paying a, a gym membership and stuff. And, For you sure. know, I, I, you know, if I suddenly have a lot of money, I'm not the sort of person that thinks I'm going to go out and splash out and, you know, like buy, buy a lot of stuff. Like, um, you know, I, I take pleasure in fairly simple things in life. So, um, you know, I, I think I just think about how I can obtain more pleasure from sort of cheaper, easily obtainable things rather than thinking of all the expensive things I'm going to buy if I suddenly got more money. I guess that's also the ancient kind of Greek way is like how can you obtain more pleasure from like the simple things in life as it were rather than always craving uh, like more rare or expensive things. Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. Well, we're talking about money. One thing that I've done is I've made a hundred dollar micro loan on your behalf to an entrepreneur who is in, uh, this entrepreneur is actually based in, uh, I usually make them to in to entrepreneurs in India. Mm -hmm. This woman is not in India. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm ashamed to say that I actually don't know what country she's in. <laughs> I can tell you she's 44 years old. She's married. She has five children. And she's going to use this to purchase cattle to increase her income right. from, from cattle breeding. So I think she's in, I think she's in Kenya, uh -huh. but at any rate, I've done that. And, uh, in case you care, I'm, I'm going to send you a, a follow-up email to thank you. And it'll have a little link in there, but that's one small way that I've endeavored to express my gratitude to you for this. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to yeah. hear more about that. It's great. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll put this in here so we don't wait to try to squeeze it in at the end, but for anybody listening, for somebody who wants to learn more from you, maybe they want to connect with you, what would you, aside from going on to Amazon or maybe to their local bookstore and buying a physical copy, what would you have them do? So if they just go to my website, which is Donald Robertson, all one word, dot name, so not dot com, but dot name, then there are like scores of articles on there with a lot of practical self-help self -help advice. And there are free online courses that people can access and audio downloads, PDF downloads and things that they can tap into. And also I'm a member of a non-profit organization called Modern Stoicism. Their website is modernstoicism.com. And they have over 500 articles from people all over the world that are using stoicism in daily life that people might want to, to read about. And they have free online courses and organize various events around the world as well to help encourage people to use stoicism to actually kind of build emotional resilience and improve the quality of life. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's great. Okay. So 
we're in the last, we're coming down the stretch in our conversation here. And the last um, part of this is, is an exploration of the creative process of your writing. And when I get here, to be honest, I've recently revamped my question set. I actually deleted the whole thing. <laughs> so I have on purpose, I have no question, no preset questions. So I want to invite you to kind of co-create the question or just talk about whatever you want for people who, let me just give this little bit of a frame to it. Again, I think people listening to this, many of them, they want to do what you are now doing, which is sharing your ideas in a clear and compelling way with others in a way that they understand, enjoy, and benefit from. Knowing that that's what this portion is about, what insight, experience, or advice do you offer to people who are either wanting to do this or they're actually in process but haven't managed to get across the finish line? Well, that's easy as well. I think, you know, this is something I think a lot about and I talk a lot about. So there's probably some specific things I can say, and then there's some more general kind of attitudinal things that I could describe. But I would say the main thing is the more fundamental aspects of your attitude. So you have to find something that you're passionate about, right? That's the main thing. Like you've got to find something that you can get really throw yourself 100% behind and get enthusiastic about. So you've got to dig deep and find out what's meaningful to you, like, you know, what seems important to you. And even if it doesn't seem like something immediately that there's a market for or that, you know, loads of other people are interested in, if you start working on it, you can find ways often to make it relevant to other people and to reach a, a wider audience with it. When I started off working on Stoicism, there weren't that many other people that seemed that interested in it, but it seemed like a big deal to me. Like, and as I dug deeper into it, I found ways to make it relevant to other people and I reached a wider and wider audience and then things really started to pick up for me. But it all stemmed from the fact that that initial kind of fire in the belly was there. Like It was something that I, I would think about all day long. I'd, be, I'd go to bed at night and I'd be dreaming about it, you know, because it was my passion, as it were. You can't substitute for that. You know, it becomes a vocation rather than something, rather than a chore. You know, you know you're onto something when you find yourself thinking about it all the time, even when you're eating your lunch or, you know, when you're lying in bed at night. Like, you know, that's, you're doing twice as much work, 10 times as much work on it because it seems effortless. It just flows naturally. So finding a passion is the main thing. And then, you know, what follows on from that, which I, it means a lot to me and is something I, I've, I've done over the years. I talk to people um, about my subject all the time. So partly nowadays, like I do podcasts and I give talk, I give a talk the other day at a local library. Any opportunity, even if it's a small audience, there's not a lot of money in it or whatever, I'll, I'll jump on that opportunity. If someone emails me about the subject, um, if I go to the barber and he's cutting my hair and he says, you know, what, what, so what are you doing uh, these days? Are you working today? What are you up to? I'll say I'm writing a book about philosophy or maybe I'm working on a blog article or I'm reading a book about philosophy. And then I'll get talking to the barber maybe about it, you know, and I'll tell him why I'm interested in it and like, I'll make it seem relevant and interesting to him. So I talk to people right across the board about the things I'm passionate about and I try and make, try to find ways to make it seem interesting and relevant to you know, most of the people that I meet. And my daughter is kind of really interested in the subjects I'm interested in because I try to find ways to make them relevant to a, a young girl. How old is she now? She's eight now, yeah. If you can make philosophy interesting to an eight-year-old, you're doing something right. Yeah, yeah, like, but it should be, you know, there's just little stories and anecdotes that can make it seem relevant. So, you know, talk, if you're talking to people all the time about it and telling people stories You'll kind of over time refine your patter, as it were. You know, you'll figure out the bits that are boring or, or people don't really relate to, and you'll get rid of those. And you'll figure out the bits that make people their eyes light up and make them seem engaged. And then, you know, you've got to reach an audience. So for me, that was you know blogging. You know, I'd be working on things, and and I'd, I'd just suddenly get inspired, and I'd turn out an article in the middle of the night, maybe about something that was interesting, put it out on the internet. And sometimes you get a reaction, sometimes you don't. But over time, you you know keep working away at it, writing dozens and dozens of articles, and you know you build up a social media following that way over time. 
you know, and then eventually you'll start to kind of get more engaged in running courses or writing books or doing other things. But for many people, I think it's finding a passion, talking to everybody you meet about it, putting it out there, whether it's on YouTube or on a blog or whatever, and then it takes some time to develop a social media following. And then you're kind of up and running these days, I think. Yeah. Again, it sounds so simple when you say it that way. And in a way, I think it is that simple. But for many people, I mean, what do you think gets in the way? I know I'm asking you to speculate, but... Well, I, you know, I've, sp- I've spoken to many, many people over the years who are, are kind of trying to get into, uh, trying to start businesses as, as therapists or get into writing books or whatever. Um, I mean, I feel f- like a lot of time it's because they're not, they haven't really found a passion. You know, like they, they've not found they're looking too outwardly at what other people are doing they think i want to be too, i want to be like tony robbins or whatever you know that's the sort of thing that people say um and then well how much of a passion can that really be because it's not coming from within you you need to dig deep right within yourself and, and find out what it is that really kind of ignites a, a fire in you not just look around you at what you think other people are succeeding at you know it's not what you know, not what other people seem to be doing and succeeding at that you should be concerned with, but, you know, what really seems meaningful and important and life-changing to you deep inside. So I, I think that they fall at the first hurdle because they haven't really found their passion. Like, so I think people need to dig deeper and ask harder questions, a bit more radical questions, like, and find something unusual. You know, this is a cliche, but you need a unique selling point. You know, you need to bring unique value to things. So if what you're doing is kind of vanilla, like, what you know, I want to, I, I, want, I want to have a, a podcast about philosophy. You know, it's just going to be kind of general vanilla flavor philosophy podcast. Like, that's probably not going to go anywhere. You need something that makes it different from all of the other kind of generic philosophy podcasts or whatever that are out there or blogs. You know, what's distinctive about it? For me, I was kind of lucky because it was this kind of amalgam of classical philosophy and cognitive therapy that, you know, is a bit different from what other people were doing. And that happened to be my passion. Um, so that gave me a kind of unique selling point. But mo- what I find is many of the people I speak to don't really have that. Or they'll tell me what their 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 plan is um, or, you know, what their, their blog or podcast is. And I think there's nothing that really makes that sound distinct from stuff that other people are doing. So I think you, you need, they need to find something that's more unique, uh, more personal, and more attention-grabbing like, to get things off the ground. And it might just be they've got a very unique voice or way of approaching things. Maybe they've got a unique sense of humor, something distinctive about it. Or it could be they've got a niche that's you know, a slightly different subject area or a combination of subjects that other people aren't doing. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Well, then with this book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, uh, not counting the index, uh, it's 270 pages. And knowing that life takes place, 269 pages, that life occurs in space and time, the work that you did to make this book a reality, will you share with me, what? how did you organize your time and what were the spaces in which you produced 270 pages of writing? So, I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily recommend my way of doing things to everyone else, but I'll tell you exactly what I do. Um, like I find out when I, I'm writing, first of all, in order to write a book like that, the research for it has been going on for maybe like 20 years because I've thrown myself into the subject. And I've been reading about it, talking about it, been talking to my barber about it. So when I sit down to write it, I'm drawing on experiences that are going back decades. It didn't just kind of come out of nowhere. Um, but then when I actually get the contract signed and it's time to start writing the thing, um, I'll um, kind of write an overview like so I'll, you normally do that with a publisher anyway you write an outline of the book and a chapter summary so I have the kind of skeleton of the whole thing and then I'll try and think about what are the key ideas that need to be in there like what are the ideas that are going to grab people what are the questions that people are going to have that they're going to need to have answered and then I also think about what are the kind of most dramatic moments? What are the little stories or anecdotes that are going to stick in people's minds? What, what are the ones that stick in my mind? You know, like what seems kind of dramatic or colourful that's going to jump, kind of jump out of the pages and keep people's attention? 
So I, I think about how we can weave that in and make it relevant to the, the rest of the book. And then um, in terms of writing, you know, I, I do believe in uh, personally in, in kind of uh, secluding myself. Like I'll go away and stay. I used to go away and stay in retreat centres or in, in like a little um, uh, place in the countryside in different places for maybe two or three weeks at a time and I'd wake up in the morning and I'd start writing and then I'd go and do yoga or jump rope or whatever and then I'd go back to writing. When I, I go away, I'll, I'll eat very simple foods. I'm not buying lots of food or cooking. So I think recently one of the times I went away, I just ate boiled eggs, drank coffee and ate apples and that was pretty much, you know, for a few weeks that's what I lived on because it took minimal preparation or, you know, I bought a bunch of eggs, boiled them all in one go and then I'd have a a few like eggs per day and a few apples like and, and drink a lot of coffee you know so i didn't have to think about food or any other distractions i'm just writing all day until it's time to go to sleep again and uh i'll do that and work away a weird thing that i found was it didn't i realized after a while it didn't really matter where i was because as long as i was in a hotel room or an airbnb and i was kind of isolating myself so i started to book into airbnbs that were maybe a couple of streets away from where i live and so you book in and the, the host would say oh so where are you traveling from and i'd say well just around the corner well <laughs> they thought that was pretty strange right yeah i was yeah. like if i'm in my house i sort of think well the bathroom could do with cleaning or you know the like maybe i should cook some of the the food that we've got in the in the freezer and the fridge or you know i should really tidy up the living room or there's endless distractions Whereas if I'm staying in a hotel or an Airbnb room, it's kind of like there's nothing to distract me. I can just focus on my writing. So even if it's just two streets away from where I live, still that still works for me. Although it might seem like a strange thing to do. And uh, and then I'll I find that when you're writing a book, you know, it normally takes around about a year. And uh, you know, after a while, you get so bored with reading the same stuff over and over again that it's hard like you you read a chapter and particularly if you want to read the whole thing cover to cover it's very hard to do that without your attention wandering so like grip my teeth and try and concentrate i'll get halfway down a page and i'll suddenly realize i'm thinking about something completely different because i've read this page a hundred times now and it's kind of where you know, my mind is just tuned out so what i'll normally do is read it aloud and i might even record myself reading it aloud and then play it back later um towards the end once i've got getting close to having a, a final draft of the manuscript i'll pay somebody to come and read the whole thing cover to cover straight through to me and then i'll have a printout of it all and i'll go through and just mark up and um, like double line spaced i'll write under like little notes under each sentence as the, 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 the you know it was my local barmaid uh, Maria, I, who, the last time who, who read it to me, and she was kind of interested in philosophy. So, like again, I'm just talking to everybody I meet about philosophy and stuff. Uh, so she'd have some comments as well and feedback. Reading this, like seven hours of reading, like seven, eight. Oh, at least probably, I think probably like two days. Like um, you know, with breaks in between and stuff like that, it would probably over like a couple of days. Like um, so, with breaks and stuff, it's maybe like. like 12, 14, 16 hours, something like that. Wow. Because um, it's hard to do it straight. So we do a chapter and then have a little break for 10 minutes where we're about to chat and stuff and then do the next chapter and so on. Um, and yeah, like just kind of like, and that helped me prepare for the audiobook, which is increasingly important mm -hmm. now, right? Audiobook sales are becoming bigger and bigger. So it is something that you know, I think writers should be thinking about. Is what does this sound like when you actually read it aloud? But it also helps me get a different perspective on the book and a sense you'll notice things that you just hadn't noticed before like when you've repeated yourself or if there's something you've missed out um you know you I, I, that you may not have spotted when you were reading through the manuscript on a computer screen suddenly it jumps out at you when you're listening to someone reading it to you and the and also where sense, things sound clunky or just don't make sense you you just get a different perspective on it so I, those are some of the things that I would do. And also, I mean, to be honest, I should say, um, like I would, I use, when I'm properly um, working on a book and writing, I'll, I'll listen to a, like a self-hypnosis uh, recording that lasts about 20 minutes, um, like maybe every day, um, like that has kind of 
suggestions in it about being really passionate about the writing and feeling more creative and, and stuff. This is like before you began the writing, not during the writing, right? Um, yeah, well, what, like during the process of writing. I mean, it, normally in the mornings, but I'm, sometimes I might do it later in the day. Um, you know, it just becomes part of the part of the process. So I'll kind of use auto-suggestion and self-hypnosis in other ways as well to try and help me get into the right, the right mindset. That sounds like a very... Uh, it's a unique from the ways of writing I've heard others use, but um, the thing about the apples and the eggs and the coffee, especially like it's just so <laughs> focused, you know, I can see why you could create a work like this. It's, that's pretty, pretty cool. What else comes up for you that might be useful for someone listening to this, either about writing the act of writing, writing theory, the creative process, advice they might have heard as a writer that they probably ought to ignore, <laughs> you know, like anything. Is there anything else that comes up before we just, uh, I ask my final question and we wrap up? I think the other thing I'd mention to people, and again, we, we hinted at it earlier, is that feedback is king. And But at the same time, you know, you need to look within yourself. So it's like squaring the circle. You've got to do two. You've got like a lot of things in life. It's a balancing act between two competing forces. So on the one hand, I think it's really important to show drafts of your work, maybe a chapter, a few passages, to as many people as you can and say, what do you think about this? Even to encourage criticism. So sometimes I'll show people a chapter and say to them, well, what's the worst thing about this chapter? Is there a bit of it that you, you, you know, if you had to, if you had to delete a couple of paragraphs from this chapter, which ones would you choose? Is an interesting question, like a forced choice. Like if you had to delete part of it, which bit would you delete? Um, and kind of like really kind of listen to people's criticism, but also to, you know, have faith in yourself and kind of believe in your vision. Um, and, you know, like it's a contradiction, like you've got to kind of balance on the one hand, listening to other people with like being able to kind of stand firm in your, your, your self-belief and, and what you instinctively like feel is right. So juggling these two things I think is important. Um, I think it's a mistake that people make if they never get any feedback or if they ignore all feedback then that's an error. But it's also it would be a mistake to go too far in the opposite direction and compromise too much like based on what other people are saying and, and, and lose your kind of inner compass and, and sense of direction. The last question I have is, you know, my experience is that my inner critic can be very loud. And I think for many creative people, that's the case as well. If there was one statement, one phrase, one piece of encouragement that people could take, that you would leave people with, that they could maybe write on an index card or a sticky note and put in their writing area or on their computer or whatever, that they might use to replace whatever negative self-talk or whatever inner critic tape is playing for them. What would that statement be if they could hear Donald Robertson in their head instead of whatever bullshit they might hear instead? What might, what might Donald Robertson be saying to them? Well, I guess there's a couple of things that come to mind. You know, one of them is that, look, the worst thing that can happen is that somebody says that they don't like what you've written, right? And as long as you get that feedback early enough, you invite criticism, then you can just adapt to it. So you shouldn't be frightened of it. So if you send out an early draft of your chapter and people say it's garbage, it's all back to front, it doesn't make any sense, then, you know, it's not a big deal. It just means that you have to, like, you know, revise what you've written and try, you know, test it out again. So the worst thing that can happen is that people say they didn't get it or they didn't like it. And all you have to do then is just change what you've written like, to adapt to what they've said. It's, you know, like as simple as that. You should be, view it as just a matter of fact part of the process. And in fact, the more you get feedback, the more you get used to doing that. It doesn't seem like a something that's very personal or very emotional. It just seems you know, part of the process of uh, working uh, on something, like you get feedback, you, you assimilate it and you respond to it. You know, it's just a, a mechanical process, as it were. And and the other thing I think is helpful, um, for me anyway, is that, you know, like how many people do you really need to reach anyway? Like, would, would it be more important to write something that a million people read and they think, yeah, it's all right, or the one person reads and they say it saved their life or it completely transformed their life, you know. And, you know, if you 
and that I think that helps you to kind of dig deeper and think about what's personal for you. Can you say something which, if your younger self or you in a parallel universe read, it would potentially be life changing? Like you know, and ask yourself very deeply, like what would you need to hear, like as a younger version of yourself? Or another version of yourself. What would they need to hear reading a book to really wow them and transform their life? And if you can do that for one other person, then is that not enough to justify the process of writing it? You know, and if everyone else is kind of like meh or so so about it, does that really matter as long as you've kind of really struck home like and had a big impact with a single reader? And that starts with asking yourself what would potentially have that kind of impact with you if you read it. And then, you know, like potentially there's somebody out there that's like you and will respond in a, a similar manner. But then the reality is if you do that, you'll probably find that you reach loads of people and have a dramatic effect on them because there are probably loads of people out there just like you. Like, you know, maybe you don't realize how many people have got the same questions or facing the same problems as you in life. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And and I wonder, I just want to check in on your experience with this because over the last seven years as I've really pursued coaching, one of the things that surprised me, I don't know, I don't know when I quit being surprised, is how many people think that their experience is unique? How many people think they're alone in having, you know, these feelings or these thoughts or, you know, these events that have happened to them? And, you know, what you're saying is very, there, there is a lot of universal aspect to us for sure. Yeah. And, and I know I said this earlier, but I really did. I loved reading your book. So thank you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure, you know, and I, like, I love talking about my hobby, you know, and so this has been a great opportunity to do that. And I, I really enjoyed, uh, your, you know, your passion uh, for, the, for, these, uh, for the interview questions and the subject. And, you know, I've had a great time speaking to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community, get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at brianmiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com. 